Hello, welcome to the Meg Quigley Summer Series. This is the fourth of eight free weekly sessions throughout the summer. I am Nicolasa Custer, a founding director of the Meg Quigley Vivaldi Competition. We launched the competition to provide an international competitive experience of the highest caliber for young women bassoonists in the Americas. There are three components to the repertoire of the competition. One, each competition since we started in 2005 includes works for bassoon by living women composers. Two, there's a requirement of speaking from the stage in order to cultivate a commitment to audience engagement and community involvement in the arts. And three, at the heart of it all is a memorized Vivaldi concerto. I and my colleagues of our all volunteer team, I invite you to support our mission by becoming a friend of Meg Quigley of MQVC. You can do that by going to mqvc.org slash donate. Today's session, the fourth in our series is called Vivaldi Interpretation and Competition Preparation. It is led by David Wells, who as a member of the executive team keeps the competition going as well as our bassoon symposium that occurs every two years and is built around the competition. I thank him for that. Many thanks to Midwest Musical Imports for sponsoring our session today. I will now turn it over to Dave and our wonderful panelists. So I'd like to uh, thank Nick for the wonderful introduction and thank uh, my whole team, uh, Nick and uh, Kristen Wolf Jensen um, and Jessica Findlay Yang, who's behind the scenes today, helping out with chat and uh, Q&A, and Shoemaker, Jackie Wilson, um, Leo Uribe, uh, Sasha Enegra, and everyone who's helped out with this series. Uh, it really does take a whole bunch of us to make all of this work. Um, so today, uh, some of you have probably been at our previous sessions, uh, which have all been wonderful and brought to light many things that we all need to be thinking about in uh, our profession and our world. And today we're sort of taking a, a little detour into uh, things related directly to this year's uh, Meg Quigley Vivaldi competition. And being that Vivaldi uh, is right in the name, we thought we'd start with that piece. We'll have sessions on each of the pieces in the repertoire um, coming up in the following week, so watch for those. Uh, but today we're going to talk of Vivaldi. And without further ado, I'd like to have each of our panelists introduce themselves, um, tell you a little bit about themselves, and also uh, maybe they can share one of their early experiences with Vivaldi. Uh, why don't we start with Andrew? Sure. Hi. I was thinking we'd do ladies first, but I guess not. <laughs> um, so I'm Andrew Brady, principal of the of the Atlanta Symphony. Uh, I've been principal here since 2016, January 2016. Um, and uh, I guess my first experience with Vivaldi was in high school. Um, you know, I was going and buying CDs, um, whatever I could with my money I'd earned from working at Dairy Queen. Um, and I got this Vivaldi compilation CD, um, you know, like best of Vivaldi. Um, so I don't think there were any bassoon concertos on it, but uh, I do remember the mandolin, one of the mandolin concertos being, um, being on it. and. Um, that was, yeah, just my introduction into that kind of sound world. So, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Now, how about Stephanie? Hi, yes, I'm Stephanie Corwin, um, and I live here in New York City. Um, and I grew up outside of Atlanta, so not so far from where Andrew is. And um, yeah, I guess my first experience was also in high school. My teacher introduced me to the E minor concerto that I'm sure many of us know and love. Um, and yeah, I immediately loved it and I played it with my high school orchestra, but I just remember being immediately taken by sort of that, that energy and spark that it has. Um, and then subsequently, so after, after school and in my schooling process, I actually ended up um, studying Baroque bassoon and historic bassoons in general. And so since then I've played a lot of Vivaldi. Um, but they're all so special and wonderful that I'll always remember that that first time that you you play it. It's really exciting. Thank you, Stephanie uh, and James. Hi, everyone. I'm James Massal. Um, I teach music history at the Manhattan School of Music. And uh, I'm also a bassoonist. I studied bassoon in college. And um, my earliest memory of bassoon was, uh, of Vivaldi was actually playing the F major concerto, which is uh, RB uh, 489. 
and my high school teacher gave it to me and I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to take me forever to learn, uh, as I think a lot of people think when they look at a Vivaldi concerto, but uh, it was a great introduction, still one of my favorite concertos, and I like coming back to it, so thank you again. Excellent. So we've got people with a you know a variety of perspectives here. We've you know all, all bassoonists. There's sort of a running joke in Make Quigley that we all introduce ourselves and say what instrument we play, even though it's all about the bassoon all the time. Um, but you know Stephanie is primarily a historical instrument specialist. You can see her Baroque bassoon behind her, which she'll tell us about in a little bit. And uh, Andrew, of course, as you mentioned, in principal of the Atlanta Symphony, playing uh, modern bassoon primarily in, in the orchestra. And James coming from a historical pers perspective. So my hope is that we'll get lots of different thoughts and ideas from, from these different uh, sort of approaches today. Um, Stephanie, one, uh, another Vivaldi, uh, important Vivaldi experience of yours, I know, was that you actually won the first Meg Quigley Vivaldi competition in 2005. And not only that, but you, uh, the Vivaldi concerto that year is the same as this year, right? RV 498. Right. Yeah, what a happy coincidence. <laughs> yeah. So can you tell us just a little bit about your experience uh, as a competitor in that? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been thinking back on that experience a lot lately. And, uh, you know, it was such an important moment for me. Um, you know, as a, as a young bassoonist coming up in your early 20s, um, I mean, for me, I felt really uncertain about what I was doing, if I was on the right path. Um, you know, I felt, you know, I hadn't gone to conservatory for undergraduate. Um, and so, there was a lot of uncertainty out there. And then to have this competition, you know, this this thing to aim for that was this very specialized niche and it was just for female bassoonists. Um, I found that really exciting. And so um, the whole process of working towards the competition itself was extremely rewarding, having to memorize a concerto, which I had never done before on the bassoon, um, having to, to practice and figure out how to effectively speak from the stage, which I hadn't really done much of. Um, all these things were really good skills to build and a really good challenge for me. Um, so, and then the, being at the actual competition was also wonderful just to be surrounded by this wonderful community of people and it was you know even though it was the first year you could tell that it had been you know in the in the works for so long and so well thought out and to see you know so many female bassoonists really being strong leaders in our field um, and providing these opportunities for us was really amazing and um and also to meet the fellow participants, you know, everybody comes with a different story and it was just a, a really lovely experience. And for me, it also was a very affirming experience because it gave me this extra sort of acknowledgement and confidence um, about what I was doing and, and helped me to think, oh, maybe maybe this is something I can do. Maybe I am sort of on on the right path with this whole music thing. Did that experience have any, uh, did that play into your decision to uh, pursue a historical instrument performance? Maybe in a very long and roundabout way, <laughs> because it was several years later that I came, came around to studying historical instruments. Um, so I had, at the, at the time of the competition, I was getting my master's at Yale studying with Frank Morelli. And I went on to get my doctorate at Stony Brook with him as well. Um, and when I first got to Stony Brook, I was with a wind quintet and that was like my thing. You know, we were busy all the time doing competitions and, and I was doing a lot of new music. I was sort of on the other end of the spectrum. And then our quintet sort of dissolved and things broke up and suddenly I had a lot of free time on my hands. And um, around that same time, all these people just kept on mentioning the Baroque ensemble that Arthur Haas, this fantastic harpsichordist, leads. Um, and I kept on thinking, okay, you know, I had no like particular predilection for Baroque music at that point in my life, but I thought, well, everybody's mentioning it. I have the opportunity to do it, why not? And so I signed up and I showed up and I immediately fell in love with it. Um, and so uh, we worked on some stuff and then a couple months later, Arthur said, well, you know, Stony Brook has, we have a Baroque bassoon and you should just learn to play it. <laughs> so, um, 
So I took it home with me and I contacted uh, Andrew Schwartz, who is a bassoonist here in town, who is now a colleague of mine, and he gave me some reads and showed me some fingerings, and I just sort of sat in my apartment trying to figure out how to play this thing. Um, so, and then from there, I, I went to some summer festivals the following summer, and that's where I met Michael McCraw, who um, later became my teacher. So after working with him, he said, you know what, I know that you've been through a lot of school, you're finishing your doctorate, but once you finish that, come study with me for just a year. And so I took a year and studied with him at Indiana University um, in the Early Music Institute. And so it sort of, it eventually came full circle from the competition, but it was sort of a circuitous route. <laughs> Oops. Great, and we'll come back to uh, the Baroque bassoon in a little bit. Yeah. Um, but Andrew, uh, Stephanie told us a little bit about being on the stage for the competition, um, but you were one of the judges, I believe it was for the final round in um, the 2019 competition. Right. Can you right. tell us a little bit about that sort of experience and maybe also the kinds of things that you're thinking about as a judge listening to a Vivaldi concerto that um, you know maybe people who are prepping now for the competition might want to keep in mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, first of all, I had an amazing time um, at that whole festival, and it was, it was um, I've never been to an IDRS, I am ashamed to admit, but um, there's been kind of a little bit of a reason that I, I, I feel like it's just too um, too much for what I'm interested in, but going to MQ, MQVC was just such a great experience, so much camaraderie, um, just really getting to know people, hear amazing young female bassoonists, it was great. So. Um, but yeah, it was um, a lot of fun to judge that final round. Um, and I think a lot of the things um, that I was listening for, I would probably listen for in any kind of competition, regardless of if it's Vivaldi. And so I, I think there's a trend for competitions to try to be as flawless and perfect as possible. Um, and yes, I understand we want to get to the highest heights of performance. Um, but it has to be um, able to move people and communicate what the music um, is trying to, to get across. So more important for me than you know flawless technique and amazing intonation is just, are you actually communicating um, what the music is intended to show? Um, so I, I think you know all those performances of the finalists were just so outstanding. Um, but what really stuck out to me was just people that were able to make the piece their own, but also express what Vivaldi, um, I think, was intending and make, keep, uh, keep it interesting. So it's not just a, a technical exercise as, you know, a lot of um, Vivaldi repetitious things. Uh, it can be easy to, um, oh, there goes the cat, sorry. Um, <laughs> she wanted attention. Um, it can be easy to kind of um, do like a cookie cutter thing. And I, I, I think, you know, I'm very interested in Baroque performance. Um, I listen to, Baroque is absolutely my favorite um, period. And I almost went into Baroque um, performance. I was at a point where, okay, do I want an orchestra job or do I want to, you know, maybe go to Europe and study Baroque performance? Um, and it just happened that I ended up um, getting the job in Louisiana Phil. So I went that route, um, but I'm still very much into Baroque performance and, you know, taking up recorder. Um, and so for me, I, I'm just looking, I, I listen to a lot of historically informed performances. I was actually, actually just listening to um, one that Stephanie was in the other day. I, I believe you were playing with Apollo's Fire. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I was looking up um, just some different uh, repertoire that I, I hadn't really listened to before. Um, and it's just amazing to hear how flexible things can be and how inventive things can be. So everybody has an idea of, you know, Baroque being stuffy, old, um, but it has so much life, I think, so much to offer, and you can be extremely creative. Um, so that, for me, is what I really want to see and hear, um, is that people are just really going for it, trying to express and communicate, um, so that it's not just a, here's another Vivaldi concerto, but, like, here's what this Vivaldi concerto is trying to say. Yeah, I... I like that you said it's not just another Vivaldi concerto, and you know, uh, there's that sort of old trope that people say, you know, Vivaldi didn't write 500 concerti; he wrote one concerto 500 times. Yeah. And I, you know, really think that that's 
comes from some performances that didn't communicate interesting things. And uh, I think there's so much life in them and so much that can be brought out of them. Um, and so many great recordings these days uh, that that doesn't really hold any water anymore. Um, Stephanie, you were also a judge in 2019, I believe. Do you have anything more to contribute on that topic? I would just like to echo some of the same sentiments that Andrew just stated. Um, you know, and as as I, I will probably allude to later, this idea of just moving the audience, I mean, that is so inherent and crucial and imperative in, in all the music of this time. So that to me, you know, the most successful participants that I heard that day were the ones that did that. And they all sounded very different from one another. And they did it in different ways. And, um, you know, they they sort of had their own stamp of, of their own character um, on it, which was wonderful to hear. But yeah, it's, it's you know, really getting past yourself and reaching out to the people to whom you're playing. That's the most important part. Um, so yeah, it was really, and it was really special to be back because that was my first time being back at the competition and symposium since the year that I had participated. Um, so to see it, how much it had grown, how it had evolved and evolved to this larger symposium with all these surrounding events and talks and master classes and performances that was really just so wonderful to see it really warmed my heart and it was it was i just walked away from there with this really wonderful positive feeling and was so happy to be able to connect with all all of these people in our community that we don't see that often so um and to meet some new people as well so it was a really wonderful experience Thank you. Uh, and I promise I did not ask Andrew and Stephanie to give plugs for the symposium. <laughs> Those are completely uh, off the cuff. Um, but it is really a, a wonderful experience. And um, it is, I think, uh, quite a different experience than an IDRS conference. And, and I hope everyone out there, um, if you haven't been to one, you'll have the chance again, you know, when we can all gather in one place and, and have concerts and such, again, things like that. Um, all right, so that's a bit about the competition itself. And I know there may be uh, some questions out there about uh, competition, and we're going to get into much more of the music um, and a little bit of the history as well. Uh, just a reminder that if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A feature rather than the chat. Um, you're welcome to use the chat also to converse with each other and whatnot. But uh, Jessica is uh, moderating things in the Q&A and forwarding things my way for that. So the reason that uh, it's the Meg Quigley Vivaldi competition, this competition for young women bassoonists, is because of Vivaldi's close connection with uh, the young women of the Pietà in Venice. Um, and for that, I'm going to turn it over to James to tell us a bit of that history. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I think actually the history here is really important. And uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's important for sort of um, some of the underpinnings of the competition. And I think it's also important just to ask the question, why did Vivaldi write so many bassoon concertos? Because um, it's really remarkable that he wrote uh, 500 concertos, almost half of them are for violin, but the runner-up instrument among those concertos is bassoon. So um, I just, I wanna talk a little bit about the Pietà and the institution and, and Vivaldi's role there. So the Pietà was an orphanage. Um, he taught violin, he was music director and these orphanages were for children um, who, whose parents couldn't support them or who didn't have parents. And these institutions would also be called maybe a hospital, ospedale in Italian, or conservatory. And this is actually the origin of the word conservatory, uh, which I'll explain in a little bit. So uh, these institutions could be for boys or girls, but the Pietà in particular, which was in Venice, um, was especially for girls. And as we've already talked about, this is one reason why the Meg Quigley competition has focused on Vivaldi um, and that connection for this music education for girls. Um, in fact, the modern use of the word conservatory came from these orphanages um, because of the heavy emphasis on music education and in addition to other subjects. So essentially, these children would come and they'd be educated receive a general education, but at this time uh, it was believed, rightly, that music was an important part of a child's education. And 
that it helped them grow in other ways besides just academic subjects. And I think it's really interesting that we're still having this conversation today, hundreds of years later, about the importance of musical education uh, inside of a general education in public school. Um, so at the Pieta, they were performing and studying both vocal music and instrumental music. Uh, girls would sing in the choir, they would learn instruments, and then in the sort of hundred years before Vivaldi started working at the Pieta, which he started there um, 1703, he spent much of his career working for the Pieta, not continuously, but whether it was teaching violin or whether it was music director, he was working there. Um, these conservatories became really important also in the musical life of the city. So in Venice, uh, it wasn't just sort of a, a a, a closed, isolated institution, um, they were actually putting on public concerts. And they were so popular, in fact, that they attracted the nobility of the city, that they were talked about in guidebooks. So people, you know, today people go to Venice and they buy Rick Steves guidebook or whatever. Well, this was happening also in the 18th century. And we know from reading tourist books from guidebooks at the time that these concerts of the Pieta would be advertised. They would say, oh, you have to go to the Pieta because Vivaldi works there. And he's a recognized one of the greatest virtuosos in Europe. And you'll get to hear these amazing children who are playing these instruments, are playing violin concertos, are playing bassoon concertos, are singing in the choir, they're performing oratorios, things like this. And so they attracted large audiences and the conservatory found that it was actually a way to start to uh, fund the institution. So they were selling tickets for these concerts, and that was helping to fund the mission of the institution as an orphanage. And it sort of it, it created this circle where they, um, as, the, as they hired better and better teachers who were able to educate the musicians even better, and so they became um, more proficient, then the concerts were even better, then they had more money for the institution. And it got to a point in the 18th century um, during Vivaldi's time and later were actually the children of noble families were being sent to conservatories to study so that you had fee paying students alongside the uh, orphans and we could think about this as a way like fee paying versus students on scholarship and this is what turned into later in the 18th century the conservatory model based on merit and fee that was focused entirely on music education. Um, so, but even though the performers in the conservatories were appreciated uh, for their talent, they were unfortunately typically isolated from society. And one of the, one of the parts of the culture at this time um, is that the, the young women who became so proficient as musicians and who were so talented, for the most part, uh, when, they be, when they got married, they left the institution, they were not able to perform in public. And their only opportunities for public performance was to come back to the Pieta to play in the orchestra as adults, or it was also possible to sing on the concert stage because women were singing uh, female roles in opera. So it was possible for women to have a professional career in music in this circumstance of singing on stage. Um, and I think, you know, all of this kind of putting it to the side, really the emphasis here is to recognize that the music education of these institutions was so strong that it was really focused on the young women and it developed a whole class of young women in Venice and other Italian cities who were exceptional musicians. Um, and so if we go to the reason why did Vivaldi write so many bassoon concertos or why did he write oboe concertos or mandolin concertos? Well, um, certainly there were a lot of violinists, string players, but there were also bassoonists and he wanted to showcase the talents of these people. And so he wrote, you know, what we, is it, 37 concertos? Um, and they are there as a teaching tool, but also as a way to showcase their, their talents. And you mentioned that, that, you know, they were giving public performances, which was uh, eventually bringing a good deal of money into the Pieta, another Ospedale. But it's, they weren't performances public in the way we expect now, where you go out and see them all paraded out on stage, right? Right, thank you for, for bringing that up. So um, 
because they were, you know, uh, minors, I guess they were, they were adolescent in the culture at the time, they didn't believe that these girls should be exhibited um, on stage, that they, they shouldn't appear on stage and perform. Um, in fact, they were referred to as nuns. So some people who would write about the going to one of these concerts, they would talk about the nuns and they had to actually perform behind metal screens. So literally metal screens were put up in the choir lofts of the church and they all were on the, the upper level of the church where the audience then would sit on the lower level. And there's a really wonderful reproduction of this that was done by the BBC. Um, it's a documentary and performance of Vivaldi's Gloria and some other pieces, and you can actually find it online. Um, I think Dave maybe has a link to provide, uh, and I, I know that he found this before, but it's, um, you can see it really clearly that these screens actually block the view of the spectators from, of the musicians, and then they bring the camera behind the screen and you see the orchestra sort of in this circle and the choir, the soloist, whatever they are also. And the other interesting thing about it is that it mixes the young students who are part of the Pieta with um, older women who, most of whom graduated from the Pieta, they left when they got married and they came back to sing. And one of the really interesting things just, um, and this is the last comment I'll make, is that in the Vivaldi Gloria, you actually have female singers singing low parts. So singing like baritone parts because men weren't singing any of the choral parts. Excellent. Yeah, I, I just asked Jessica if she can find that link and post it in, in the chat. I have the video, oh, there it is right there. So take a look at that when you have time. It is, it is really, truly fascinating. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the kinds of instruments that these young young women might have been playing because they didn't they weren't playing their Heckel eleven thousands or whatever your bassoon du jour is. Uh, you can see Stephanie's uh, Baroque instrument right behind her, so I'll ask her to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, this is a Baroque bassoon. It is a replica of uh, a German instrument from around the seventeen twenties. Um, but as you'll see. The most noticeable difference, if you haven't seen one of these before, getting caught up in my modern technology, uh, is that there are far fewer keys on it, right? So we only have five keys. Um, actually, besides the keys, I would say the most noticeable, the most important difference is the size of the bore. So the whole bore of the instrument is much larger. So that even starts at the reed. Um, so. This is my reed, which is, for sake of comparison with a modern reed, quite a bit larger. It's sort of uh, similar in size to a contrabassoon reed. Um, so the whole diameter of the instrument is larger, which creates a different sound. So especially in the lower register, it blends really well with the low strings and the other continuo instruments that you're often playing together with. So it creates this really, well blended unified sound um, and then up high it gets a, a little bit brighter and particularly in french baroque music uh, a lot of that stuff is is written in the upper register of the bassoon they would have been playing on a slightly different type of instrument than this that was more well suited to that register but we play in it on this all the time um, and so i'll just play a few notes to give you a sample of the sound so we have a similar range, uh, a bit smaller than the modern bassoon. Started a low B flat. We don't have a B natural, so go from B flat to C. And then all the way up to generally a high A. You could sort of eke out a B flat or something if you were really having a good day. Um, but everything hasn't dried out. So that's the low B flat and just for all of you that may have perfect pitch, just remember that I am tuned, this instrument is tuned at A equals 415. So it's yet a half step lower than the modern bassoon. Um, and then we go pretty high. So it had sort of uh, 
a less focused sound than the modern bassoon. And the, the main reason for that is, you know, the context in which these instruments were used, in which they existed. Um, you know, this worked really well in these sort of smaller chamber settings, playing in churches. Um, but then as, as time goes on and the idea of going to a concert sort of evolves, it steps out of being an event in the church or at the court um, and becomes more of a public event and you have larger spaces and larger concert halls, um, our instrument has to change to accommodate that because this is not going to reach to the back of a 3,000 seat hall. So, um, so and also the, the repertoire changes, right? So we get placed in an orchestra, we have sort of more of a soloistic role in the wind section. And so for all those reasons, we need that projection and you get that projection with a smaller, longer bore and a smaller reed so that those vibrations sort of travel a little bit faster and further. Um, so that's the introduction to the Baroque bassoon. Excellent. So that pitch difference is something to keep in mind as we get, uh, we may have some demos going back and forth between Stephanie and Andrew in a little bit, and they'll be a half step off from each other. Uh, and also, uh, I hope we'll have time to talk about recordings a little bit later. And those will be at various pitches. So don't be alarmed if you start playing along, trying to play along with an A minor concerto and you're like, wait, this is an A flat. What's going on? Uh, it's just a difference in, in pitch center. Um, so Stephanie alluded a bit to the uh, sort of changing of concert culture, um, changing of styles and how that influenced uh, instrument construction. Um, I want to spend, you know, the bulk of the rest of the time getting into style and interpretation and all of that. And maybe James can give us a sort of introduction into, you know, the, the general Italian Baroque, where these concertos fit into an overall idea of style, things influencing them. Sure. Yeah, and I, I want to pick up on something that um, Stephanie and Andrew both said earlier, and that's that Baroque music is about flexibility and it's about emotional expression. Um, and there's a really important distinction that needs to be made between the Baroque music of the early 18th century in Germany, we often think about Bach, uh, and focus on counterpoint and fugue and that kind of thing. And the origin of Baroque music about 100 years before, uh, in 1600, so again, about 100 years before Vivaldi started working at the Pietà, the Baroque really originated in Italy, and it was, in fact, the opposite. It was about breaking free of the restraints of counterpoint, where composers, especially there was a composer named Monteverdi who ended up working in Venice um, and really revolutionizing the, the music scene in Venice, which is where Vivaldi lived and worked, and he said, I should not need to follow the rules of counterpoint when I want to ex when I want to set an expressive, dramatic, and emotional text. I want that freedom to write dissonance, to write um, passaggi or the, these like colorful um, embellishments. And when it, if we boil down to what Baroque music really means and what the Baroque really is, it's about a direct expression of intense emotion, and that happens first and foremost with vocal music. It happened with opera. Opera originated around the beginning of the Baroque period and it flourished throughout the 17th century and uh, particularly in Venice. And so when Vivaldi starts his career, opera is the most important genre. And we have to consider what are the stories that are being set for opera? What's the content of this? In fact, Vivaldi said that he wrote almost 100 operas in his career. It is an astounding number of operas, considering that he spent his career as a music director at a conservatory. Um, unfortunately, only about 20 of those operas survived. But when we look at the stories of operas or oratorios, which is a similar type of dramatic vocal genre, we can get a sense of what these emotions really are. So I always like to use this example of an oratorio that Vivaldi wrote in 1716. So it's, you know, four or five years, something bef before he wrote this concerto. And it is truly a violent and disturbing story with a lot of emotional intensity. And just to boil it down in a nutshell, um, the story comes from the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, and it's where uh, a general, a female general named Judith, uh, tricks her enemy, the enemy general, into inviting her to a party at his camp. And at this party, she actually takes his sword 
and she cuts his head off. So she murders him. And this is like, this happens um, not just in the text, but it happens also through the music. So Vivaldi sets this gruesome and intense text with emotionally intense music. And so then when we look at the instrumental music, we need to think that in fact, the instrumental music is coming from a similar place. The instrumental music is there to express the similar types of emotions or as we, we call them affects that exist in the vocal music. And particularly a piece that's in a minor key like this A minor concerto, we can start to make connections to these stories. Now, it isn't always that extreme kind of R-rated violence that we might find. It could also be an intense feeling of love and attraction or exuberance, or it could be sorrow. Um, but what we have to connect it to is real emotion and not use vague words like being expressive in this place, but we have to always think expressive of what? And it's, it's common when we learn music to say, well, what kind of story goes along with this piece? Well, and that's actually very appropriate for this kind of music. But we have to say, what kind of story? What stories were they thinking about? And so that's why it's helpful to look, what are some of the operas that Vivaldi wrote? What stories was he attracted to when he wrote the operas or the oratorios? And then we start to see that they are, um, they're not simple, they're, um, they're not boring by, by any means, and they deal with real tragedy and sort of the real essence of, of life and drama. Yeah, there's so many truly operatic moments in, the, in Vivaldi's concerti, in, in his bassoon concerti. I think particularly a lot of the, the second movements could be arias um, uh, and should be, uh, you know, interpreted as such and, and uh, get every little bit of emotional content out of them. Um, so let's go from that into just some, some of the nitty gritty. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll ask Stephanie first, uh, you know, I think probably for a lot of people, especially when they're when they approach their first Baroque piece, the th word that comes into their mind first is ornamentation, and that can be a very daunting kind of topic. Um, so, how how should people get started with this, or uh, particularly in a in a Vivaldi concerto or this Vivaldi concerto? Sure. Um, yeah. So it's it's very much in the style of the Baroque that they would ornament, and we all we all know that. Um, so I think we have to just remember to stay grounded in this idea of the affect of, of music as rhetoric, because that was such a pivotal and important piece of, um, of what everyone was doing, music related or not, during this time. Um, so I think it's easy to be tempted to sort of go a little crazy with ornaments sometimes and think, you know, prioritize them a little too much. So I think always keeping in mind, you know, sort of the essential character of the piece, what it's really trying to say, and how can you add ornamentation to help help say that in a more eloquent way. Um, so, for instance, it's this has been pretty interesting because I'm picking this piece up again. This is my first time looking at it since the, the competition in 2005. Um, so I have my part here, and it has so many tiny notes written in that it's unbelievable um and that just makes me laugh a little bit because you know that's very tempting to do and to plan it all out um but i would advocate the opposite so i think really first starting with the piece itself finding finding what speaks to you about it and what you think it's trying to say and then making sure to add the ornaments later they're sort of the frosting on the cake you don't want to cut into a piece of cake and have it all be frosting. So, um, so I think it should always be in service of the of the affect and of the music. And don't be afraid of some, you know, sparse moments. So, for instance, in the second movement of this concerto, um, you know, it, it opens with this lovely phrase, and then this this sort of second part of of the movement, it's very sparsely written, um, and it might be tempting to sort of create your own music to fill that in. But I think it's actually serves the music better to, to maintain that dichotomy of this sort of lush opening. Maybe you could see it as, as something like that. And then this other area, if you're looking at a floor, it's around uh, bar 103 or something, um, that's just a little bit more sparse. And it can still have that same, you know, have a sense of suspense or anticipation um, without 
filling it out with notes too much. So um, I think just making very conscious choices about what you're, you're doing in terms of the ornaments. Um, thinking about what types of ornaments you're going to use. You know, of course, there's sort of two categories we can put them in. We can have sort of localized ornaments that are, are trills, small things, little turns, um, or we could have larger scale ornaments that might be filling in a scale or using arpeggio, something like that. Um, but really asking yourself, like, why am I putting this and why am I putting it here? Um, those are always good things to keep in mind. Um, and another good tip that I like to follow is to do a lot of time away from the instrument when you're thinking about this. So singing the part in your head, singing the music, and then just, you know, adding something that feels completely natural. Um, and then sitting, you know, if you sing that and then say, okay, what was that? And try to figure out what the notes were, what the rhythm is. So not being bound to it, not necessarily writing it in your part. I would practice, practice your ornaments as an improvisatory element. Um, and lastly, one other, uh, if you're feeling just completely like a fish out of water, like you haven't done this before and it's completely new, you don't even know where to start or what sort of thing to do, um, it's really good to just look at the music that already exists. Some of, so much of this is already written out ornamentation that he's done for us. So, you know, look at the figurations that he uses, the patterns, um, and, and use that as a starting point. So for example, um, just the very opening, you can just add something very simple, but it's, it's totally something Vivaldi does all the time, so. <laughs> So it's just adding a little a couple of sixteenths here and there in this sort of neighboring note pattern um, that's very typical of what Vivaldi does. So if you're looking for inspiration, looking at Vivaldi or looking at other uh, Italian Baroque composers is always a good place to start. Excellent. Um Andrew, what about your approach to ornamentation? Or do you maybe have a, a different version of the opening that you could play us? Put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, for me, coming from a uh, performance, uh, type of performance where I'm trying to strictly stick to what's on the page most of the time, um, I generally do tend to try to plan things out. Um, I try to leave rooms that I, there is spontaneity because I think that's one of the big reasons for ornamentation is so that um, not everything is so strict and there's there's room for expression in addition. Um, so I try to have options and actually just like Stephanie said, um, what helps me the most is if I'm just you know walking around the house singing and I do something interesting. I'm like, oh, that sounds really nice and maybe it could work and fit in this in the style. So definitely away from the instrument is really helpful. Um, just singing. Um, and not only for ornamentation, but just any piece you're learning, it'll help um, really cement your interpretation and give you new ideas. Um, so I do a lot of singing. And then I do a lot of listening um, to just historically informed performances. Um, there are resources um, written, sorry, cat again. <laughs> um, you know, there are tons of resources, um, like, you know, the art of flute playing the quants, um, or on playing the flute, I believe it's called. Um, and you, uh, it's not uh, Italian Baroque, but I have some sonatas by Telemann for recorder, where he actually has written the, um, you know, the sparse line, and then below it, he has his own um, additions of what he would do ornamentation-wise. Um, so just really listening to other, seeing other and listening to other, um, people, how uh, other composers, how they've ornamented um, and how they think about adding that to their music. Um, as far as, uh, you know, this opening, I don't know if I could do it as good a job as Stephanie, um, but. <laughs> something it doesn't have to be much um and I, I think that's a problem a lot of people run into is they try to make it as florid and um you know overwrought <laughs> and it really doesn't have to be 
much, just a little spark, you know. Um, and it can be especially useful, like later passages, um, I'm thinking um, second movement, where you have this long, um, uh, a lot of the same kind of um, rhythmic and motivic gestures. And, you know, as it goes on, you can do something slightly different. Um, you know, throw some uh, kind of triplet in there or um, just something so that it's not one long um, line of the same thing, just a little bit of something to add some interest. Um, and I did want to uh, point out, just because it comes up so much, um, not just in Baroque music, but in any kind of music that I, I teach, um, and that I play is that I hear um, it has to do with cadential trills um, and how they fit into the affect and the character of whatever piece and movement you're playing. Um, like I hear a, a lot, um, say like in a slow movement. Um, and just really, you know, it's spinning and it's, it's, it's not the character of that movement. So I think um, we have to, uh, you know, time our trills and not necessarily time it in, 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 in the sense of, you know, measured, but I think they have to fit the context of what you're playing. Um, so that's kind of my approach. Um, and again, I just kind of keep playing around. Sometimes I'll write some things in, um, just little reminders of things that I've done before um, in terms of ornamentation. But um, I'm trying more and more to leave it open and just um, the more I listen to those, you know, historically informed performances, the more it kind of gets in my ear what's possible. Um, so I'm more able to just do it in the moment. Yeah, and just to jump on uh, something that Andrew just said too, if I may. Um, with those cadential trills, it's so, it's so true. It's such an easy trap to fall into to sort of create this sort of shape. Um, I think it's important to remember the importance of dissonance during this time. So we really want to, in, in all of this music, it's so important when you have those opportunities to lean into the dissonances, you gotta use them. And so that's what all these cadential trills are, especially, you know, this is why for the most part, you're gonna wanna start most of the trills from the upper note. And especially a cadential trill, that's why you lean into that first note a little bit and then you come away. So, um, so it's a little bit of a different shape than we might have gotten used to in our, in our more modern practice or when playing romantic music. I mean, what's interesting is to just think about, you know, the music from this time and then there's so much that has happened between then and now and all of that music is in our ears you know during this point this was new music for the people playing it so you know we have all these romantic impressions and modern impressions and we sort of have to try to look beyond that back to what was happening here and what their sort of practices were during this time so that's that's one of them is you'll usually just shapes in general are a little bit more um front loaded with a sense of a taper rather than any sort of like growth in the middle for much of it. <laughs> and I just want to tag on to um, your talk about dissonance. Um, it's just, I don't think any other musical period has handled dissonance and, and resolution in such a beautiful way. Um, I think Baroque just, that's the, the pinnacle for me. Um, and I'm, I'm such a nerd <laughs> and I'm listening to, uh, uh, recordings, if there's like a uh, cadence at the end, you know, or, there, or there's a four, three uh, suspension, <laughs> I'll, I'll just be, you know, sitting in my car and hold that four as long as I possibly <laughs> can, because I, I want to feel that that tension and then the, the final release. Um, but yeah, for me, that's so much what this music is about and how it expresses is, is just the harmony. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and just going, going on that as well is that's another important element of the ornamentation, right? Is we always need to be aware of, of the harmony and the harmonic motion of what's happening. And it, that's also a really good uh, tool to help us decide what to do for ornamentation and for pretty much everything else <laughs> in the music too. So. 
All right, we're, we're sadly running out of time. So I want to hit some questions uh, from the audience, things that get into some more uh, specific elements of, ter- of interpretation. One following right on from your trill discussion, um, a question about terminations of cadential trills, whether they should be a termination, a knockschlag, or not, or whether it's situational. Can you give a, 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 sh- a nutshell answer to that? I mean, I think it's often, it can be held. I mean, I think it's just in the moment, whatever feels right. So very often, I would say I, I do that a lot. Um, and something like this, it's also helpful in this situation where it might be an opportunity where you you might take a little tiny bit of time. So having that knock shog is a really good clue and indication of when you're going to land on the downbeat so everybody else can be there with you. So it's sort of a, it can serve a logistical purpose, but it could also um, you know, it can also work without it fine. So I think it's just a matter of, of taste. Um, if it's not literally written there, I think it was certainly part of the practice, but, um, you know, not, uh, not necessary 100% of the time. Great. Thank you. Um, another, uh, here's one from Jackie Wilson, um, wondering about the use of vibrato. And this may differ whether you've got a Baroque bassoon or a Modern bassoon in your hands. Anybody yeah, is welcome uh, to jump on this. I'll start and then I'll let Andrew talk about so we can sort of go forward in time. Um, yeah, so vibrato was very rarely used. It was, I mean, it was used during this time, but strictly as an ornament and um, not not used very much. Also, um, one thing that they refer to in terms of vibrato is actually a finger vibrato where you're sort of shading one fi- a finger that's far away from what you're playing to sort of have a slight fluctuation in pitch. So it's not the sense of like using the air, using the diaphragm or your support or anything like that to change that. And it's not to, you know, enhance the beauty of one note in the same way that we do it now. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, they had different tools at their disposal to do the things that we like to do with Rotter now. So they, I mean, the, I think it's just sort of the purity of the sound leaning into those dissonances and, um, you know, using the, the air is how I like to, whenever I have a student who seems very tempted to use vibrato on the Baroque bassoon, I always just remind them to go with the air and just enjoy the, the actual vibration of the instrument itself. You know, that's one of the things about the Baroque bassoon is because, you know, you don't like the, the bore is just unlined, you know, everything is just very natural you can feel this resonance when you play it it's this vibration that just goes all through you so i think focusing on that sound is um is the thing for us but of course as the instrument evolves things change (laughs) yeah so um i try to be very careful with how i use my vibrato um and make sure that it's not an on all the time kind of thing and that when I do use it, it's to augment what's going on in the music uh, or highlight, you know, tonally dissonant places or um, places where the um, kind of the arc is, is peaking. Um, I tr- yeah, I, I try to be pretty sparse. Um, it's probably not quite as sparse as a, a Baroque bassoonist would be. Um, but beyond vibrato, just going to air, um, I try to be varied with how I use my air. Um, so that it's not just always the same way of blowing. Um, it, like I mentioned, I, I play recorder, um, and I, I've been researching into you know how the different articulations, um, like where in the mouth you're actually tonguing, how you're putting the air behind it um, to get the sound and the gesture that you want. And for me, Baroque music is so much about gesture. Um, so that's what I'm focusing on. And if vibrato helps to augment the gesture, then I will use it that way. Yeah, Andrew mentioned um, articulations, and we could spend a whole hour easily just talking about articulations. But some of the resources uh, you mentioned earlier, like uh, Kant's treatise and uh, a number of other treatises from the Baroque period, really talk about um, this in often in context of other wind instruments, but it's very applicable to bassoon as well. Um, and that's so that's something I'll recommend for homework for everyone to go look into that, since we <laughs> we can't I think get into it in our last few minutes here. Um, so. Why don't we wrap up with sort of a lightning round? Um, I'll get 
two questions around. So first, uh, th and this will be for everybody, can you give just one sort of preparation tip for uh, working on a concerto specifically or a, a, a concerto in general or Vivaldi concerto specifically, it could be about memorization since that's a component of this competition. It could just be about practice, could be about listening, anything you'd like. James, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Okay, um, sure. I, you know, you, you just mentioned listening. I would say listen to as many recordings and listen to them a lot. It's, um, you know, sometimes I, I've heard people say, well, don't listen to recordings because you need to come up with your own ideas. You need to develop your own sense of um, musical personality and all of that. And it's just, in, in my opinion, not the way that music has been passed down. It's not the way people have learned music. Um, you, you know, if we imagine how were the girls in the Pietà learning, they were learning um, by listening to Vivaldi demonstrate. They were learning by listening to each other. In fact, they, they acted as mentors for each other. They would play, they would emulate. And so the idea of a style of performance that sort of is passed down for decades at least comes from listening and imitation. So you find somebody that you as a master performer and you want to do the things that they do. Now there's all the technique you have to learn on how to do that, but the emulation part of it I think is, is necessary. So that's my very brief answer, contribution. Andrew? Um, I guess I'll approach it from memorization, which has not always been my strongest suit, um, but I would try to, you know, map out the piece, actually sit down, write out um, the different sections, how it gets to, from one section to another, the tonal centers, um, the cells or the themes from each section. Um, so I'd, I'd have that mental map going on. Um, and then also, you know, practicing it, not just starting from the beginning, but from different places within the piece. Um, so that's my little thing about memorization. And I'll just add on to that memorization bit too. So like we were talking about before, I think singing is really important. So if you just are constantly having that music in your head, you're gonna start to embody that music. And also if you're listening to this style of music, to other, to Corelli, you know, to anything, um, you're gonna sort of gain by osmosis this sort of sense of style. Um, but I think singing is really helpful. I think also another helpful tool in memorization is also being aware of the other parts. So in our case, especially it might be a fun thing to take advantage of during this time when we can't play with other people, because you might want to play the bass line and maybe record yourself and then practice playing along with it. Um, and so that'll help you sort of get your harmonic foundation going. Sorry, just to tag on to that too. Um, a big tool for me for memorization um, is I practice with solfege all the time. Um, you know, any piece that I'm playing, I will, if I'm learning it um, for the first time, I, before I even, I might play through it once slowly, um, but then I'll just, you know, finger along solfege um, and just do that slowly so I know what's coming up and I'm not just solely relying on fingers. Um, I have the brain going. Excellent, thank you all. I think for our very last question, um, it'll just ask you to recommend one or more recordings of this particular concerto. And you don't have to all have different answers, so it's okay if someone takes your answer. Uh, let's go Stephanie first this time. Okay, um, I really enjoy the, the recording by Sergio Azzolini. Um, I think he's made a couple. I like the one from, I think, 2003, which is, has faster tempos. There's one where it's quite a bit slower. Um, and I also want to mention the recording. I think so. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and I want to mention the recording by Michael McCraw, my beloved teacher, who we recently lost. Um, but he also has a fantastic recording there. A lot of, of really interesting things that he does in terms of like taking time and spots. Um, so that's also well worth a listen. James. I'm going to have to second what Stephanie said. Um, Sergio Azzolini, Azzolini is my go-to Baroque bassoonist, and I also prefer the slightly faster recording. Um, but I did, in preparation for this, I did go back and listen to Mike McCraw and Danny Bond, and there's just some fabulous um, variation in the, in the approach of interpretation on this piece. So um, 
got to recommend listening to all of them and then choose the path that you want. Um, so <laughs> at Salini, I love, <laughs> I think he's just so inventive. Um, and you know, he, it's not outside of the character and not outside of what would, they would have been doing at the time. And it, I just think it's, it's so, um, live, I guess, just the very, um, connecting. Um, and, um, just because I, uh, I, I love, I, I wouldn't say it's a historically informed performance and I don't think it would, um, I don't think I necessarily want to play it this way, but um, Marisa Lard, I, I really like that recording. Um, just, I mean, on the French bassoon, it kind of sounds close to Baroque bassoon. Um, and, you know, his facility on the instrument is just incredible. And I believe in that recording, he has bassoon playing continuo, which I, I really like in Baroque, even though like just bassoon sonata, um, having the soon on the continuo, the tone is, the timbre is just really nice. Yeah, and there, I, I was looking this morning, there are so many recordings of this concerto out there. We focused on the ones on Baroque bassoon mainly, um, but there are plenty out there on modern bassoon as well, fairly recent recordings. Uh, Thomas Ben Koch, and I'm sure I'm butchering his last name, um, uh, Nadina Mackie Jackson, there's a whole bunch out there. So as I think everyone has said today, go listen to a bunch of recordings find what you like, find what you don't like, synthesize it all and come up with your own sort of approach. All right, we've reached the end of our time today. So thank, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for being here today. Thank all the attendees for showing up and asking wonderful questions. Um, thank, I'd like to thank Midwest Musical Imports for their generous sponsorship of today's session. Um, watch out for announcements about future sessions. Um, the next couple, I believe, will be focusing on um, previous competitors and what they're up to now and their, their experiences in the competition and since the competition. Um, so look to social media and join our mailing list if you're not on that already. Um, I, we're all gonna go away from the screen, but I'm gonna leave chat up for a couple of minutes. So if you have one last burning question, you might be able to get it into a panelist, but thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.